Tony Livesey. When Daryl Hare accused Pakistan of bull tampering in last summer's Oval Test, he couldn't have predicted the furore that would follow. Pakistan refused to leave their dressing room in protest and the test was awarded to England. The ICC had no issue with the result, but Hare was later banned from top-level umpiring for two years. Hare sued for racial discrimination, but the ICC claimed his skin colour was not a factor in their decision. James Pearce was at the start of the tribunal today. Tapping his left shoulder. The penalty of five rounds. Was it something more sinister? Sinister, sinister? To be found guilty of ball tampering is a very serious charge. Pakistan dressing room and the door is closed. This is the making of a much bigger incident. Bigger incident, bigger incident. It was a day the like of which followers of cricket have never seen before. This door remained firmly closed. Behind it, the Pakistani players locked in the dressing room. They should have caused some coming out onto the pitch, but instead all that the crowd saw were the two English batsmen coming down these steps here, and the two umpires. But who would have thought that the life of one of those match officials was about to change forever? It's been pretty much hell in, in the life that I knew. People have been very misinformed and didn't you know, actually decide to ask uh, questions before they, before they reported on things. And you know, it's been very difficult for me to accept that the life was, was turned upside down, there's no doubt about that. I had to leave my house um, and you know, go and, and, and stay in a hotel with my wife uh, for five or six days and that was on, the, on police advice. Uh, for an umpire to have to go into hiding after making a decision on the field, I felt, uh, you know, what's become of the game. And the situation was even worse abroad. Darrell Hare had to endure pictures of his effigy being burnt in Pakistan. The allegation in Asia in particular was that he was a racist. Well, that's just not true, but you know, uh, I don't really intend to, uh, to discuss that much. Um, you know, that's, that's not me and people that know me know that that's not true. I don't feel I have to explain myself. Um, uh, you know, you can't control what's, uh, what's out there on it. And um, you know, it's disappointing that, that those things are there, but they're not true. For the past year, Hare has fought to clear his name. He believes that he's taking a stand on behalf of fellow members of his profession. Right now, there's a feeling of frustration. Disappointment um, that um, you know, the umpires making a decision can be challenged in, in such a way. And um, not just the umpires challenged, their, you know, their, their life virtually um, you know, uh, attacked and ripped apart by people who don't know the truth. There were two umpires out there. We had a, two decisions to make and we took those decisions. Um, they say you took the decision. Well, people may say that you know, umpires make mistakes, uh, but they make honest decisions, and they make those decisions for the good of the game. Do you think it was a mistake to take the bales off the stumps? Uh, the laws provide for certain things under, under certain circumstances, and I think it was pretty clear that you know, one team was refusing to play. And you know, if you've got the courage of your convictions to, um, to make those decisions, I, I make no apologies. And what about the whole idea that the umpire's decision is final? Well, it's not, is it? You found that. In a big way. And so to the latest episode in this ongoing drama. Enter stage left, Daryl Hare, to the Central London Employment Tribunal this morning. It's a dull looking building, but what's been happening inside here today has been anything but dull. It's a tight room. On one side sits Malcolm Speed, the chief executive of the International Cricket Council. Just a few feet away from him, on the other side, is Daryl Hare, the man whose allegations could shake the ICC to its very foundations. Hare is claiming that he was a victim of racial discrimination, a charge denied by the ICC. The tribunal will hear details of why Hare believes he was singled out because of the colour of his skin, while his fellow umpire at the Oval, Billy Doktrov, who's West Indian, went unpunished. What I want is for people to understand what happened um, and uh, the truth will uh, come out in the tribunal. And most of all, you know, I want my family to be able to understand um, you know, uh, more about the situation. You know, umpiring has been my life for the last 25, 26 years, so uh, I think it goes without saying that um, you know, I, I, you know, I miss international umpiring, there's no doubt about that. Well, it's going to be a fascinating tribunal, no doubt, but it will raise the question, shouldn't the umpire's decision be final? Well, of course it should. 
There are no two ways about it. Yes is the answer. Steve War said so all, uh, uh, all along. And the problem is now, after this debacle, is that cricket's got nowhere to go. And same for other sports. Teams have now got a new weapon. They can stay in dressing rooms for five minutes, ten minutes. They can make a protest. They can not come out. It's, Who's to say they're right? It's straightforward intimidation. You saw it there. It was hostile there. Um, it's, it's no wonder this has ended up where it's ended up. And, you know, it's, it's given ideas. It's set ideas. And it's just, a, it's, just a classic, it's just a classic ruse now. The problem is sport has to protect its officials. TV's done well. I mean, it's given us all a great view of football, cricket, all sorts of sports. But it's also left the officials very vulnerable indeed. If you're in an executive box... You can see a game uh, before half time. You can hang, draw, and quarter the referee. You'll see all the different angles. He won't. Jose Mourinho ran up the touchline with a laptop to complain to a fourth official. The referees do need protection. Many of the referees, and Graham Paul on this very show last series, said that they wouldn't actually feel comfortable having that there. Well, that's nonsense. They feel it's extra scrutiny. It's, it's rubbish. They, they desperately need the technology there. What hasn't been worked out by anybody involved in domestic football or international football is how you use the technology. It's that simple. If the people, as, as Tony says, in the VIP boxes are using it, and if Jose Mourinho was running up and down the touchline when he was still employed, showing people, uh, you know, showing people on, on the computer, it's a way to work it. And there must be a simple... The problem is, if you were an official in a major game, you used to be the arbiter of that game. Now it's your job to root out the cheats. What about... Batsmen don't walk anymore, Gabby. The bad feeling. He had to go into hiding Daryl Hare. We know Anders Frisk had death threats against him. Uh, many other cases where referees... It's, it's impinged on the rest of their life when they leave that sports ground, whatever sport it is. What about the bad feeling towards these officials? Well, this is why so somewhere, someone needs to step down. There was the case of Urs Meyer, the referee in 2004, Portugal, disallowing Sol Campbell's header, I think it was. And, and his name was, his, his phone number and his email address was published in papers. Now, that's absolutely outrageous. Someone will end up being killed because of stupid behaviour. It's happened in America with those ghastly chat shows, it will happen here with a sporting official. But officials need to protect themselves and take on board the technology. I think it's folly to refuse to have it. What about the grassroots? Neither of you have talked about, you know, kids and having the role models. We always bring up rugby as an example of a sport which obviously does seem to have less of this kind of rounding on the referee. What about the players taking responsibility and leading by example? Well, rugby is the great role model. That's why it's brought up all the time, Gabby. Not because you're married to a former half-decent rugby player and a fantastic dancer too. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is it is the role model. If you watch 11-year-old kids play rugby and you watch 11-year-old kids play football, there's no comparison. And that's why certainly in London, I don't want to talk exclusively about London, but I know for a fact that the football referees in London are working closely with rugby union referees and that is the way. They have to have that control. But that doesn't. what's going to happen to kids who are over 12, 13, 14, 15 and playing professionally? OK, thank you guys for the moment.